yeah, getting back to messy objects, we haven't done one in a little while. Um, so I went to the website for Deep Sky Videos and I thought I'd just sort of go along and pick, in order to just more or less pick one at random, I thought I'll just numerically go through them and pick the first one in numerical order we haven't done a video for yet. Uh, and it turns out I didn't get very far because we've done M1 but we haven't done M2. So I thought I'd do a video about M2. It's a globular cluster and there are many globular clusters. So we've done a bunch of globular cluster videos. Uh, we just happen to happen to have, don't happen to have done this one yet. Well, it turns out conveniently, having decided I was going to do this one, obviously the next thing I do was then look on in the literature to see what there is about it. And it turns out just a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a paper called The Double RGB in M2 CNSR at BA Abundances. Oh, hang on, I'm going to give that a go. You ready? Okay. Carbon, nitrogen, strontium and barium. There you go, you've done enough of these periodic videos now, you know those, right? They've been looking at some of the stars in this, uh, in this cluster and measuring the abundances of these various chemical elements. And it turns out, although that seems like a fairly random collection of elements, uh, it actually has some sort of astrophysical significance as to why the detection of those particular elements is interesting. There's a, a piece of common law about globular clusters, which is that they're the simplest stellar systems we know about. All the stars in them are exactly the same age and have exactly the same chemical abundances. And because of that, they're a very simple stellar population, which means that they have very simple properties that we should be able to predict with reasonable accuracy. So that's, you know, that's what I was taught when I was learning about astronomy. Uh, it turns out it's a fiction. It turns out that actually globular clusters are much more complicated than that. And so to show you that, if we back up a little bit to a paper from uh, last year, where this is uh, another paper looking at a whole bunch of uh, globular clusters, but one of which is our friend M2 and looking at the properties of the, the colours and brightnesses of the stars. So I need to show you a picture from this particular paper. So these are these things called colour magnitude diagrams or Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. We've talked about them a few times before, but basically what you do is for each star you measure its colour, how blue or red it is, you measure how bright it is, bright stars, faint stars, and you plot each star on a diagram like this. And the conventional wisdom says if you have two stars that have the same mass, then they will have absolutely identical properties because everything else about them is the same. They're the same age, the same chemical abundances and so on, which means when you come to measure their properties, like how bright they are, what color they are, they should both be identical. And that means that what you would predict on a diagram like this is that all the stars should basically lie on a single line where the only thing that's changing as you go along the line is the mass of the star. And what you can see is that's not actually what's going on. There's a kind of a lot of scatter in this diagram. Quite a lot of that is just down to the observational uncertainties. It's hard to measure these properties very accurately. But if you look very closely at it, you can see there's something more interesting going on. The sequence here is not, there isn't just one line here. There's actually a second line here. And in fact, this, which is kind of a blurred version of the same kind of data, shows it rather more clearly that there's actually two sequences here. There's not just a single line of stars. There's actually two different lines of stars here, which means that these stars can't all have the same ages and, and chemical properties. So what they found is that when they looked at a whole bunch of globular clusters, they kept finding this effect, which is, it was already known in just like one or two globular clusters, things are quite complicated. What they're finding is that this seems to be a generic property of clusters. They often have these multiple sequences. And so actually this here, although it says NGC 7089, this is M2 again, which is the other name for, for M2. And although it's not the most clear cut of these examples, it actually has one very strong sequence here. So this is stars of one chemical uh, set of chemical properties and ages. But there's actually a whole load of stars over here. So just below that kind of big black region here, there's a whole bunch of stars there, which isn't just due to experimental error or anything like that. This is this whole second family of stars, which must have different properties to those that we were just looking at. That then gets us to the, the paper which came out recently. They weren't actually looking at this part of the diagram. They were looking at way up here on the red giant branch, but they were interested to know whether this kind of pair of sequences continued all the way up to, up to the, the brightest stars. They found indeed that that was the case. And so what they did was they actually started taking spectra of some of these bright stars, so spreading the light out into the colors of the rainbow, looking at where there's absorption due to different chemical elements. And so let me show you some of their results. So this is just a couple of stars from the two different sequences, so from the, which seem to have these, these different properties on the color magnitude diagram. And if you look at the spectra here, you can see basically they're completely different. Well, some of the lines are the same, right? Some things fit together, like the, the, so there's a, a light line and a dark line here. And for this line here, this hydrogen line, they both lie on exactly on top of each other. But for other lines, they really don't. So for example, the light line here, there's a little dip. So there's a little bit of absorption due to this chemical element. And the dark line, there's much more absorption, which means there's more of the element. In this case, the element is strontium. And there's the same story with barium over here. And these two chemical elements are sort of interesting because they're what's known as S process elements. And it's again, it's to do with the nuclear processes by which these, these particular elements get made. But what we know about them 
is that they only get made kind of after a, a couple of hundred million years. So in the first couple of hundred million years of the lifetime of a cluster, none of that element gets made. And then basically stars start spewing out strontium and barium. So if you want to do this with two generations of stars, if you want to have one generation of stars that's kind of made first of all, and then that generates some more heavier elements and spews some of that back into space, and then some of that material then gets made into a second generation of stars. If the second generation of stars has more barium and strontium in it, that means that that material must have been spewed out from the first generation of stars, and that only happens after a couple of hundred million years which means that there's kind of a window that this second generation can't have been made immediately after the first generation. It must have been first load of stars get made, then you hang around for a few hundred million years, then a second generation of stars get made. So even that very subtle measurement is actually telling you something about the time scale on which these multiple families of stars got, get made. And really the story is that the formation history of lobular clusters is much more complicated than we thought it is. It's not just one burst of stars and that's it. It's these multiple families of stars getting made. There's one or two cases where they've even found three different generations of stars being made, more usually sort of two families of stars, but over a relatively extended period of time, hundreds of millions of years. So it's like they're doing the DNA of the stars and finding out who is whose grandmother and grandfather. Absolutely, and you can really tell the, you know, the, 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 both the, which stars belong to the same generation from these, these, this sort of fingerprinting exercise. Mike, astronomers look at stars all over the galaxy and it's, it's well known that stars are made from the remnants of other stars. Even our own sun is an example of that, isn't it? Our yep. sun's not first generation. Why would they possibly have thought globular clusters were immune from this kind of recycling, rebirth system? Because unless you look very carefully, they look like they're a single generation of stars. If you don't look really carefully at those sequences on those colour magnitude diagrams, it really looks like there's just a single sequence there. And the fact that we see those beautiful sequences immediately kind of shouted out, this is a simple, single generation of stars that's led to that very simple set of structures. So it's actually quite subtle to find that actually, no, that's not the whole story. There's more going on. I mean, they're all very old, right? I mean, globular clusters, they were made 10, 11, 12 billion years ago, so they're all very old. And the thing is that they, all old stars actually look rather similar, right? Young stars, you know, th stars that are 100,000 years old look very different from stars that are a million years old. So, you know, things that which are, are all young look very different from one another. But the difference between a star that's 9 billion years, 10 billion years, 11 billion years, it gets very subtle to try and tell what the differences actually are. So it's actually quite a difficult measurement to make. Did you actually look up what the thing looked like? I did look up what it looks like. It looks like every other globular cluster. It's a round, fuzzy collection of stars. Um, it's actually it's a little bit more interesting than some because it's actually a little bit elliptical in shape. It's not completely round. It's one of the more massive ones. Um, it's, sec it's the second object that Messier put in his catalogue, but he actually he didn't discover it. It was discovered about 20 or 30 years before he came across it. When Messier found it, it was sufficiently fuzzy that he couldn't even tell it was made of stars. He just saw it as this sort of nebulous thing. Uh, it was, I think it was Herschel, about another 10 or 20 years later, who actually resolved it into stars for the first time and was able to say this is a uh, stellar cluster. But unfortunately, globular clusters, it really is the case when you've seen one, you've pretty much seen them all.